We are so glad that you are worshiping with us here at the Loma Linda University Church. I'm Joelle and this is Stu. And for the guests out there, we're part of the pastoral staff and this is the time where we love to share what's going on here at the Loma Linda University Church. Today we begin a whole new series, Back to Basics. Pastor Randy will be sharing this series with us. We're really excited about it. A lot of prayer and time has gone into planning this. It will be about the fundamentals and the foundation of our faith and our walk with Jesus. There's something for everyone, regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey. Then this afternoon at 4.30 is a very special Vespers. It's entitled Avenus Flirtation with Fundamentalism, a presentation by Dr. Michael Campbell. And you kind of say, why should I care? This particular Bible conference that he's going to be talking about, the 1919 Bible conference, really shaped many of the things of how we view Ellen White and how we view the Bible. We really encourage you to come out. It can really provide some important insights for your spiritual walk. That's this afternoon at 430 right here in the sanctuary. And then just a heads up, next week, our own Heralds of Hope is going to be presenting the Vespers next week at 430 right here in the sanctuary. After Heralds of Hope, next week will be Senior Game Night. It's coming back. Pastor Daryl Retzer and his team have planned an awesome evening for you. It will be in room 105 from 6 until 9. Bring your favorite game, light refreshments will be served, and a good time will be had by everyone. Now, we've been talking about it for several months now, this very special trip in September to the seven churches of Asia and Greece. It's going to be an incredible trip. There's still a few seats available. But if you have questions regarding this trip, put on your calendar January 24 at 7 p.m. Ezer, many of you have gone on the trip, is really a beloved tour guide. Also, Dr. Larry Garrity, Dr. Kent Bramlett, just an incredible team that's going on this trip. You'll be able to come that evening and ask all the questions you want about the trip. That's January 24 at 7 p.m. Also, I don't know anyone who doesn't love a good story. There are so many great stories out there. Stories inspire us. Um, they teach us lots of lessons and are just a way to connect with each other. So here at the University Church, we're actually looking for some stories. Specifically, we are looking for people who have had an encounter, a profound encounter with Jesus and how that has changed and transformed your life. If this is something that you would like to share, uh, part of your story, we would love to hear from you. We have a form online where you can give us some information and see if this is something that possibly we can use in one of our upcoming sermon series. We really encourage you to do that. It's so wonderful to hear people's testimonies and to be able to share with the congregation. It brings us together and all of us have such unique experiences, so important. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, check the website, the app, and of course, we're always happy to see you at the UConnect Center in the foyer. Happy Sabbath. On behalf of our entire pastoral staff and everyone behind the scenes, we love you. Have a great day.
We are so blessed with such great music and talent around here. Thank you, Kimo. Welcome to worship at Loma Linda University Church. What a beautiful Sabbath day to gather together and fellowship together. And in the words of the psalmist, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And what a privilege we have to worship together our maker and our savior. I want to invite Pastor Randy uh, at this time and the Ice family to come up here for a special interview. Thank you, Pastor Darrell. Welcome. Happy Sabbath. It's kind of a cool Sabbath in Southern California. 37 degrees at our place this morning, Roy. You're a little higher. Was it pretty cool there, too? Yeah, it was uh, like 38. Oh, mercy. Must have been crazy. <laughs> Talked to some friends this morning down in the front and first serves from Canada. They said up in British Columbia, wind chilled was 40 below. And that's why we live here. That's right. We're in the midst of a heat wave here, so. <laughs> but welcome. This is a day that many have not been looking forward to, but this is a day when we're going to talk with Roy and his family. I talked with you a bit about what has been happening in their life and experience. It's really been quite remarkable. Roy has accepted an invitation to be speaker director for the Faith for Today Media Ministry. For those of you who may be visitors or may not be aware of Faith for Today, Faith for Today is one of the legacy Adventist ministries. It's been around for decades. Now, in all of that time, Roy will be only the fifth speaker director, and that should tell you something about kind of the elite group and company that Roy is joining, in terms of being able to do ministry in an even broader framework. Roy has brought many blessings to our church, our congregation, and our staff. Roy is one of the people that I know that is the most capable at taking an idea from dream all the way to implementation, to do so in an amazingly brief time in an extremely creative way. Roy, God has blessed you with that, and you have blessed this congregation with that as well. For those of you who attend the Bible Lab, you already know this, but I'll repeat it here. You will be pleased to know that there is a relationship that has been forged between Faith for Today and Loma Linda University Church. So we're going to continue the Bible Lab, and Roy will continue his teaching there, which has blessed hundreds of members, not only of our congregation, Roy, but of members well beyond the walls and the boundaries of this church. But it's not just Roy, Roy's family, his wife Dinah, and the boys over there, Colton and Riley. This is a ministry family. Now, I can tell you that Roy has a pastor's heart, and that would be true. This family has a pastor's heart. Uh, they have joined him in ministry in extremely effective ways. We've been very delighted for them, and we're, I'm especially delighted to be able to tell you that they're not leaving this community. So this is one of those strange goodbyes that's not a goodbye <laughs> because Roy is just kind of transitioning in ministry, but will remain here local. He and his families will continue to be members of this congregation, and we're very thankful for that. By the way, you ought to know this is a special day in Dinah's life. This is Dinah's birthday. That's right. <clears throat> Dinah turns 24 years old today, and, uh, and she's happy to finally have reached that milestone, Dinah. So. <laughs> so, Roy, tell us what you're thinking. What's going through your heart and mind? Well, I'm worried people will think I'm married to a 24-year-old, but <laughs> don't judge me. All right. I have to say, I, my family and I have as you can imagine, extreme mixed emotions. The first emotion in, in our lives is truly a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. We are part of a pastoral staff like none other in the world. A pastoral staff that has challenged me, that has supported me, that has coached me, that quite frankly, I wouldn't even be considered for this position at Faith for Today had it not been for the staff here. And I can't say thank you enough. To not be able to join with you weekly 
and to experience what Scripture says, iron sharpens iron, uh, I do truly feel a sense of loss in that. Not only that, but under your leadership, Randy, our pastoral families, the spouses, the, the children, we get together on very frequent uh, opportunities to eat together, to play together, to grow together. And we are experiencing the loss that we will not be able to continue that. Roy and I are both from Texas, and in Texas they say, we'll leave the door open and the lights on in the hall. So, <laughs> Which is a good thing, because I have no idea how, how poorly I'm going to do <laughs> in this next college. But we have a sense of loss. Mm. But we also have another emotion, a sense of extreme joy. Mm. When the conversation started about this position at Faith for Today, we never imagined that God would bless us with the ability to remain in this community, to remain part of this church, to continue to roll up our sleeves, and now to volunteer to help to grow disciples in this community and to be blessed by a community, a church that is unlike any other. And because of that, we have extreme joy that despite the fact that God's calling is, is at times challenging, yeah. He, in our lives and in our minds, has blessed us extremely with a church family that we love dearly. We couldn't imagine leaving and going anywhere else. And so we're delighted that God has allowed us to not uproot from this incredible community, but to maintain a part of the journey that you're on as well. And so we are joy-filled today that we get to do that. And we just want to tell all of you, thank you, thank you for being such an incredible community and we're delighted to be able to stay. We're not going away, we're going astray, is what I'm telling people. <laughs> I hope that you, as our beloved Loma Linda University Church family, as you see Roy and Dinah and Riley and Colton around our church campus, around town in the coming days, that you'll love on them and let them know just how deeply their ministry has been valued and how thankful we are. They'll continue to be a part of this community and then wish them God's richest blessing as they enter a new phase of ministry. Would you thank them right now? We certainly want to remember Roy and his family in our prayers as they take up this added responsibility and have a, a broader ministry. And again, I want to say welcome to you on behalf of the pastoral staff, those that are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary, those that are worshiping with us via the internet, LLBN, or whatever means, and we are glad that you're a part of our worship here today. Welcome to worship.
Shall we bow our heads? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for being here as promised. Now there are some here that have come with great joy. Others, their hearts are filled with sorrow. And I just plead with you, Lord, whether they're here in the congregation or wherever someone is joining us this morning for this worship service, may they experience your Sabbath rest today. And Lord, we're starting a brand new sermon series, Back to Basics. And whether someone is seeking to make a decision to serve you or have been in the faith journey for a long time, we just plead that your Holy Spirit be present here with Pastor Randy and all of us, wherever we might be. Speak to our hearts and draw us closer to you. We certainly long for your soon coming and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. As a young man, I used to love to go to the mail. I wanted to go to the mail and get something exciting. There was the unknown in the mailbox. It could have been a, uh, my grades, or it could be a long-awaited-for Valentine's Day card from that special someone. Usually would never come. <laughs> but the air of expectancy kept me alive. I was alive waiting by the post office box. Well, this, this week, friends, Something very special happened in the mail. All the late mail that, is still, that was still earmarked 2019 came in. Over $100,000 came in on top of the total that we reported last week. Amen. Amen. For our building program. So we're just so excited. We want to share the good news with you. If we kept that to ourselves, that wouldn't be right. So I'm going to be candid with you. 1.75 million came in for our giving season last year. I'm just so, so thankful to God through you. You have supported this program. We have so much to look forward to. We're waiting. I think the waiting will refine our spirits a little bit. And uh, we're still waiting for some things. But we're very excited that in the springtime we will be able to move into our new um, our new building. Friends, we build this for a reason. It's not to serve the purposes of man. It is to serve the purposes of God. And we build for his kingdom. And I want to thank you for being a part of that.
Hey, little ones, where are you out there? Pastor Shauna has something so neat to show you. Go ahead and collect that lamb's offering as you come on up. Grown-ups, hold it up high so they know where to go. Kids, make sure you get back around the aisles and up in the... Oh, yeah, don't come down yet until you collect from up. Shoo! Goodness, you guys have a hard job to do. Thank you for working so hard every single Sabbath. While you come up, we are going to sing I am a C H R I S T I A N. I hope you are good at spelling. If not, you can look up on the screen. Here we go. I am a C. I am a C H. I am a C H R I S T I A N. Amen, and I have C-H-R-I-S-T in my H-E-A-R-T, and I will L-I-B-E-E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y. Did you make it okay? All right, that was Tempo Delerno, so we're going to speed it up a little bit, a little bit faster. Okay, here we go. I am a C. I am a C-H. I am a C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N Amen! And I have C-H-R-I-S-T in my H-E-A-R-T And I will L-I-B-E-E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y Boy, that last one especially, that's a lot of letters all together, especially when we go faster. I am a C. I am a C-H. I am a C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N Amen! And I have C-H-R-I-S-T in my H-E-A-R-T And I will L-I-V-E-E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y Well, good morning, boys and girls. I love your enthusiasm this morning. Now, boys and girls, you may not know something, but parents, adults, Moms and dads, they spend a lot of time in research and study in designing toys for you. That's right, did you know that? There are people who actually, their job is to design toys that are creative, that are educational, and they help you learn. Guess what some of those toys are? Their blocks, their Legos, their connects. How many of you have some? Do you have some at home? Oh, they're wonderful. Well, boys and girls, today I brought with me Joffrey Delizo. Now, Joffrey goes to Loma Linda Academy and he is in the third grade. And I am told that he is a master builder. He builds while he's waiting for his parents to pick him up. He builds in the classroom, he builds all over. And when I asked Joffrey, why do you like building so much? He said, you know what? As long as I can remember since I was a baby, my dad has always built with me, and I love that. Now, Joffrey, I have asked you to be up here with me because we are going to build something. But, boys and girls, it's hard to build if we don't have some space. So everybody sitting here, I'm going to ask you to move over there. Move on to the steps, okay? So that we have some space, so that we can build something and watch Joffrey build something. Okay, can you just move to the side? Okay, so I brought, I brought some blocks, but I need you to sit back. Go back. And I brought some blocks, and I am going to ask Joffrey to build something. Now, Joffrey, what would you like to build? A tower. He wants to build a tower. So, Joffrey, would you like me to dump it out so you can see all the pieces? Okay. Boys and girls, go back. Move back just a little bit, okay, sweetheart? Can you sit down? Let's dump this and give Joffrey some time. And, Joffrey, it looks like you may have extra helpers. Okay. <laughs> Okay, boys and girls, how are we going to let Joffrey build his tower? Put them all down. Put them all down. <laughs> we needed 20 times the amount of blocks. Okay, Joffrey, let's see. Can you build something? Can I ask you to move to the side? And Joffrey, I'm going to have you build it up here, okay? 
You think you can use some of those? Man, you boys and girls that know exactly what to do and how to build a tower. Here you go. Yeah, we're gonna give this. You can hand it to Joffrey. Okay, why don't you build a tower here and let's sit back. Oh, blocks are a good one. Let's give him the blocks. That's excellent. I am so excited to see the tower that Joffrey's going to build. Here's another piece. Wow, I'm sure one Christmas this all sold out of the stores when they invented blocks. Yeah, we have lots of helpers. Okay, let's see the tower that he is going to build. Ooh, it's getting high and taller. And Joffrey is looking at all the pieces and how is he going to make it fit together? Ooh, I like that. Oh, he's building a more elaborate one than first service. Wow. Look at that tower. You have two more pieces. Let's see, where's he gonna put it? Ooh, that's taller than you. My goodness is right. Let's see, oh, wow. Okay, look at that. <laughs> Boys and girls, something, sit down, sit down so everybody can see. Something that I noticed that Joffrey did was, if you look at the bottom, he stacked the blocks to fit one on another all the way up, which is the foundation of his castle. Boys and girls, that right there is important that you have a strong foundation. In fact, there's a parable in the Bible that talks about the foolish man who built his house on the sand, and then a wise man who built his house on, the, on a rock because it all has to do with the foundation. Now, boys and girls, our sermon is going to be talking about the foundation of our relationship and friendship with Jesus. We need and we want to have a strong foundation so that nothing breaks it down and that we can continue our journey with Jesus and grow. Boys and girls, I want a strong relationship with him. Now, we built a tower, Joffrey built a tower for us, and kind of half the fun of building a tower is knocking it down. So Joffrey, go ahead. Oh, yay. Boys and girls, this afternoon, maybe you wanna build a tower with your mom or dad. Think about today, and building from basics. Okay, boys and girls, you have been so attentive. Thank you so much. You can go back to your seats now. <clears throat> For those of you who would like to be involved in children's ministries, we have a need for teachers in our youngest Sabbath school classes. If you think back to when you had a child, remember those days that were really hard sometimes to get out of the house and to actually get to church? Some of my parents feel that every single week and I could really use some help in teaching during Sabbath school time from 10.30 to 11.30. If you find that that's somewhere that you wanna help, please go ahead and connect with me. Thank you and happy Sabbath. I learned an important lesson from that children's story. <laughs> and that lesson was, if I had been leading the construction project out there, that's exactly what it would have been. So <laughs> we're thankful to have people leading that know extremely well what they're doing. Didn't Joffrey do a good job of building his tower? I thought that was excellent. We love our kiddos, love them here at University Church, and love them in our worship. 
I'm going to invite a family, Dave and Gianna Boehner, to come up bringing a little one who is going to be presented in dedication to Jesus today. A moment like this is always such a highlight in the life of a family. David, welcome, welcome, Gianna, welcome. This is Alexandra Skye, known to her friends, family, and fans as Lexi. So this is Lexi here. Lexi, we welcome you here to church today. We're glad you're here. Now, many of you know David and Gianna. David and Gianna both went to school here. I got to know Gianna, first of all, in a religion class for dental hygiene students. David, I was trying to remember if it was in class or at church or both, but I knew you around this community and knew you for a long time. Grew up here in this community. They have deep roots in this community, though now David is a dentist in Escondido and Gianna is a dental hygienist in La Jolla. Well, she also works for David as well. All right, you keep him in line, John, at the office too. So. And they had just six months ago a joy and a delight enter into their lives by the name of Alexandra Skye, or as I said, Lexi. They wanted to bring Lexi back to this church that has real significance in their life uh, to dedicate her today. It's hard for me to believe, but it was 11 years ago when I had the privilege of officiating at a beautiful wedding down in Ontario when you all joined your lives together. And here we are 11 years later going to do a dedication. Now, this family loves to travel. They go to Mexico often. They love to be in the outdoors. And this little one, they are blessed of God because she was sleeping through the night as of about one month old. Is that right? She wakes up smiling. David, you said she didn't get that from you. Is that right? <laughs> but sleeps all night long and wakes up smiling. Lexi, you are the envy of a lot of parents here right now. Would you come to me? All right, there we go. I'm going to kind of hold you over here so you can see that Mommy and Daddy are still close by. It's not just Mom and Dad who take great delight and great joy in little Lexi but their grandparents and other family and other friends here to celebrate this very special moment of dedication. And I want to invite them to stand. Would you stand where you are right now? Excellent. Wonderful. Well, people keep standing in the back and on the sides and the middle. That's wonderful. Well, all these people out here, as you well know, are not only members of your extended family and friendship circle, but they will be ones to whom you can turn for support and help and wisdom in the raising of little Lexi. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. This act of dedication is an important act in the life of a congregation as well as in the life of a family. In your mind's eye, you can see young parents, Mary the mother and Joseph the stepfather of Jesus, bringing him into the temple to be dedicated to God. And if you follow that young baby's life into adulthood, you can see the mothers bringing their little ones to him to be blessed. And we're standing in those footsteps today, the footsteps of so many who have gone before in bringing little Lexi in dedication. Now, Mom and Dad have written something that I'd like to read. If I could get that from you, um, Gianna. You know, these things work perfectly until mine didn't work, and so I'm glad you have yours here. Now, I'm going to read that to you. This is to you, little Lexi, okay? It says, Our dearest Alexandra, you are the light of our lives and the most precious gift from God. We've only known you for six short months, but they have been the most fulfilling, and we feel blessed to be your parents. Our hope and prayer is that we provide you with the love and guidance you need to shine as a beacon of God's love in all that you do. We love you forever and always, your parents, Mommy and Daddy. Thank you so much for writing that. And now, little Lexi, we're going to say a prayer, asking Jesus to bless you in a very special way. Would you bow your heads as we pray together? God of grace, this little bundle of life and joy that I am privileged to hold today is your child, whom you love more than life itself. Lord, Mommy and Daddy and all the rest of the family who stood, come today bringing her in dedication to you. We pray that your spirit would be present in her life today and always. We pray that she would grow up to be healthy and happy, 
to walk with you, and to bless others. And for all these things, we thank you in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So David and Gianna, God's richest and best blessings to you and to Lexi in all the days ahead. Now, Lexi, you want to stay here with me? I think so. Ah, she's reaching back to Dad. <laughs> so God bless you in rich and wonderful ways. Absolutely.
As we mentioned earlier today, we start a new series called Back to Basics. The focus of this series is on the fundamental elements of coming to Jesus and walking with Him. Whether you are considering the possibility of a discipleship journey with Jesus, or you have been traveling this road for a long time, there is something for all of us as Pastor Randy helps us return to the fundamental aspects of our faith. Today's message is entitled, Believing. Please join me as we read our quotes. He does not believe who does not live according to his belief. You can't tell it like it is if you don't believe it like it was. A man's real belief is that which he lives by. What a man believes is the thing he does, not the thing he thinks. To believe in Jesus Christ is something more than mere sentiment. It is a living faith in a personal Savior who can and will ransom from sin. Something to think about. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Today's New International Version, you can find it in your pew Bible on page 1581. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. All those who do evil hate the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But those who live by the truth come into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Nineteen fifty nine was the year that Vince Lombardi became head coach for the Green Bay Packers. Lombardi, as he took over the Packers, wanted to build a winning team and a winning culture, and so he knew he had to be good on the basics. They had to do the basics well if they were to have any chance of truly being good. So at the first practice before the Packer team, Lombardi held up a football looked at the team and said, men, this is a football. To which wide receiver Max McGee said, slow down, coach, you're going too fast. (laughs) In another sport and another coach, that understanding of doing the basics, basics well was just as keen. It was down the road from us years ago, John Wooden, the head coach of the UCLA Bruins basketball team, was meeting with his team for the first practice of the year. I think the first-year players must have been bewildered and befuddled. Here they were listening to this coach who would become a legend, ready to play for him, and he began the practice by explaining to them how to put on their socks. Pastor Philip, you pointed me in the direction of that illustration, and I thought, how to put on your socks? Wooden would explain, if they don't put on their socks appropriately and well, their socks will bunch up and they will end up with blisters on their heels and between their toes. So they have to know that right. They have to do it well. I looked it up. Wooden continued to preach that before every practice and every game. Put your socks on right. Basic. Or I think of Admiral William McRaven. Admiral McRaven, 36-year Navy vet, SEAL, known for his exceptional work ethic, 
for that for which he stands, his consistency. Gave the commencement address at University of Texas in Austin back in 2014, an address that by now must have been viewed by millions of people. I want to read you a piece of the address that McRaven spoke to these seniors graduating in all kinds of fields, eager to get out and make a difference in the world. Here's what McRaven said to them. Every morning in basic SEAL training, my instructors would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they would inspect was your bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly on top of the rack. Rack, that's Navy lingo for bed. It was a simple task, mundane at best. But every morning, we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened seals. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. By the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that in life, little things matter. If you can't do the little things right, you will never do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made, and a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. If you want to change the world, start out by making your bed. Footballs, socks, beds. It doesn't get much more basic than that. And yet these astute minds, these minds that rose to the top in their respective fields, knew one simple secret. If you get away from the basics, you're in trouble. If you want to succeed... Learn to do the basics well. So we're talking about spiritual life. And in our spiritual life, in our spiritual journey, it is no different. For that reason, we're going to take five Sabbaths together, five Sabbaths in which we go back to basics, the basic realities of what it means to walk this journey with Jesus. Believing, turning, listening, speaking, and doing. Five weeks together, and today we begin with believing. Now, if we're going to talk about the basic of believing, I don't think there's a better passage, a better book in Scripture to which we could turn than the Gospel of John. Because the Gospel of John is all about believing. That's core to why he wrote the gospel. In fact, I want to read to you just a brief little paragraph, almost, not quite, but almost at the end of the gospel of John, where John gives us the very clear purpose as to why he wrote the letter. Biblical writers don't often do that. In fact, they rather seldom do that. Just spell out, here's why I'm writing. But John does it. And I want you to listen to what he says the purpose of, is for which he wrote the gospel. John chapter 20, starting with verse 30. This is what John says. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John is very clear. It's almost as though he's engaging in conversation with the reader. And the reader's asking, why'd you write that? There were three others after all. And John has a clear and ready answer for that. He says, I wrote this. I structured it in such a way that would lead you to believe. That's my purpose in writing. In fact, I have an interesting assignment, a task for you to try sometime. Sometimes sit down with the Gospel of John. And take a highlighter in hand, and every time you come across the word belief or believe or believing in the Gospel of John, highlight it. By the time you're done reading the Gospel of John, you will have highlighted over a hundred times. 
because he just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back to this issue of belief. In fact, he does something more than that. The other gospel writer said that Jesus performed miracles. John does not use that word miracles. He says Jesus performed signs. Why does he call them signs? Because signs point to something. And the signs for John point to the evidence that Jesus is who he claims to be so that you might believe. It's his whole purpose in writing. Now, if we say, okay, if we're going to talk about the Christian basic of believing, then the gospel of John is probably the best place to go in Scripture. Then I would add to that, there is within the gospel of John a personality, a character, which I think is the person we have to turn to in John's gospel if we're going to talk about belief. And that's a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I probably should have named this sermon Nick at Night <laughs> because that's what happens here in this chapter. I want to ask you, as we read through the story of Nicodemus, just keep track in your mind of the number of times John talks about believing in this story. So John 3, starting with verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can anyone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. All those who do evil hate the light and will not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But those who live by the truth come into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Nicodemus was a good man. Nicodemus was a religious man. Nicodemus was a religious leader. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now in our parlance... Pharisee has become a negative word. It actually has become a put-down. Such would not have been the case in the world of Jesus. A Pharisee was someone who was at the top of the heap in terms of good people, righteous people, people concerned about obeying the law, about being pillars to society. Those were Pharisees. That's who Nicodemus was. But there was a hole in his soul that nothing had filled. There was something that gnawed at him. All of his religious rituals didn't satisfy that deep hunger. You say to me, Randy, how do you know that? Well, I'll tell you this. 
Had he been satisfied? Had he been at peace? There is no way he would have been found speaking to an itinerant Galilean peasant rabbi. Something in what he had heard Jesus say had spoken to him to the degree that he got up at night, slipped into the dim and dancing shadows down the street, into the garden, and onto a bench in front of Jesus to find out how can I fill the hole in my soul. People have wondered. They've wondered, why did he come at night? Some have said, well, he came at night because he didn't want to be seen. He didn't want to be seen in dialogue with this rabbi. It would damage his standing in the community. And that's true, but I don't think that's the reason. Others have said, well, he he came at night because that's the time when matters of religion and faith were discussed. The day's work was done. Time to sit around the fire, and now the leaders can really talk, and others can gather around and can listen to what they say. That's true, but I don't think that's the reason. I think the reason Nicodemus comes at night is because he is torn apart inside between faith and doubt. You have to remember, after all, that in John's Gospel... John is very thoughtful about how he uses language and imagery and metaphor and how he tells stories. Even in this very passage we just read, John assigns a deep spiritual meaning to light and darkness. The fact that John highlights that Nicodemus came at night is almost without doubt a way of John saying he comes because he's still in the darkness. He's still wrestling, still grappling with what to do with this rabbi. But he's come to maybe expose himself to the light. So Nicodemus comes and starts by saying, now, we know, we, 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 we know We know you must be from God. I mean, come on, look at what you're doing. We know. Now, I find that word, that Greek word, know, to be of interest. I want to read you from from a scholarly source the sense of that Greek word. When, When Nicodemus says, we know that, listen to what it is. That is to know or have knowledge about someone or something normally as acquired through reflection or Thinking. So this is a cognitive process, an intellectual process. And Nicodemus sits down in front of Jesus and says, we've thought about this, we've wrestled with this, we've discussed this, and we've come to the conclusion, you've got to be from God. You must be from God. Aren't you from God? I mean, come on, look at what you're doing. We're sure you must be. Are you? And Jesus cuts Nicodemus to the quick. Because rather than answering that question, he takes him back to basics. He, in essence, says, Nicodemus, before we deal with those things, let me just talk to you about footballs and socks and beds and the new birth. You need to start with a new life from within. That's where it begins. That's what must happen. Now, it depends what version you read it in. It can be rendered the new birth or born again or born from above, but they're all driving at that basic that says it must begin deep and inside as a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then Jesus expresses surprise. I love the way that Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase, the message, renders the words Jesus says to to Nicodemus. Just one line. Here it is, verse 10. You're a respected teacher of Israel, and you don't know these basics? You're coaching the team, and you don't know about tackling? You're coaching the team, and you don't know about free throws? You're a Navy SEAL. You don't know how to make your bed. Seriously? Nicodemus, you're a teacher. And yet you've forgotten the basics. 
And the rest of what Jesus has to say drives him back toward that basic. It is summarized in the most elegant, immortalized language in one verse. It's a verse we all know, and if we were all quoting the same version, we could quote it in unison. But today I want to ask you just to listen to it. Those familiar words of John 3.16. As Jesus summarizes this basic of belief and how the entire plan of God works. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I see three truths in those simple words. Simple. The entire plan of God contained in 25 Greek words, or if you read it in the English of the TNIV, 26 words. The entire plan. Truth number one. God loves the world. God loves the world. Now, we have to understand exactly what Jesus is saying here. And in order to do that, I want to take you to a New Testament scholar, D.A. Carson, as he talks about that Greek word that in English is translated world, the cosmos. God loves the cosmos. I want you to listen to what that means in the context of John's gospel. Here's what Carson writes. It is extremely important to understand what John means by the word world. Except for a few instances where the world refers to the physical earth, the word always has a negative value. The world in John is a symbol for all that is in rebellion against God, all that is loveless and disobedient, all that is selfish and sinful. When we read, therefore, in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, we are not to think that God's love is being praised by reference to the world's bigness, but by reference to its badness. This ugly, sinful, rebellious world this sewer of infidelity, this glut of endless selfishness, this habitation of cruelty, this lover of violence, this promoter of greed, this maker of idols, this world God loved and loved so much that he sent his son. God so loved the world. And that world includes you. I don't care what you did in the past. I don't care what you did last week. I don't care what you did this morning. You're part of the world. God loves you. Don't gloss over the fact that in making that statement, Jesus is saying, and John is writing, the answer to a question which haunts many. In those quiet moments, in those dark times, in those empty spaces, knowing what our lives look, up, look like from the inside out, we sometimes wonder, if I were known, would I be loved? And Jesus says, God so loved the world in all its badness and that includes you Arthur Miller was a playwright maybe best known for his play Death of a Salesman Arthur Miller fell in love with and married the woman who was no doubt at that point in time Hollywood's most acclaimed actress Her name was Marilyn Monroe Miller and Monroe got married, but over a period of time, that love that had been so intense and that chemistry that had bonded them so deeply together began to sour, and Marilyn began to spiral downward into depression and despair and to a world of drugs. In order just to survive, life got truly dark. There came a moment described by Arthur Miller in his autobiography, Time Bends, a moment when Marilyn had yet one more time managed to persuade a doctor to give her another shot. When she was finally able to fall asleep, 
that Arthur Miller describes standing there looking at her as she slept. I want you to listen to Arthur Miller's words as he describes that moment. He says, I found myself straining to imagine miracles. What if she were to wake? And what if I were able to say, God loves you, darling. And what if she were able to believe it? How I wished I still had my religion and she hers. Fame, fortune, desperation. And then turning to say, Am I loved? Do you know what I wish? I wish that Nicodemus had scooted over on the bench and made room for Arthur Miller and Marilyn Monroe and you so that Jesus could have said, God so loved the world. And Arthur, that includes you. Marilyn, that includes you. And then his eye would fall on you. And he would say, and that definitely includes you. That's the first truth. God loves the world. But there's a second truth in this passage. And that truth is this. God expressed His love. He expressed it. It didn't remain as a feeling inside, as a sentimental experience. It didn't remain as a thought. It didn't remain as something that, that He said is part of my being. It was not sufficient just to love because true love has to express itself. God expressed His love, and He expressed it by giving the gift that outgives every other gift, the gift of His Son. It's a gift that Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians, had to coin a word to describe. He didn't even know how to put it into words. So he finally just said, thanks be to God for, for His indescribable gift. God expressed his love. Now, once again, understanding a word will be very helpful. Just like understanding the word world is helpful in the first point, I want you to understand the second word. I, I go again to a scholarly source, New Testament scholar Robert Mounts where he's talking about that word that so many of us know, though we've never maybe even taken a Greek language class, that word agape. Listen to what Mounts writes. The heart of the gospel, he said, is not a philosophical observation about the character of God as love, but a declaration of that redemptive love in action. For God so loved that he gave. The Greek verb is agapao. It is common to discuss three Greek words for love, eros, philia, and agape. The first is used of passionate desire, not found in the New Testament, and the second of a fondness expressed in close relationships. The third word, agape, was w rather weak and colorless in secular Greek, but in the New Testament it is infused with fresh significance and becomes the one term able to denote the highest form of love. And then comes a sentence I love. Bible scholar A.M. Hunter highlights the significance of agape by noting that while eros is all take and philia is give and take, agape is all give. That's what Jesus says. For God so loved that he gave. He couldn't keep from giving. That was the nature of his love. But do you know what the truth is? The truth is the familiarity of this verse, the familiarity of these concepts causes us to too quickly pass it by 
and to not linger long enough to take in what it really means. Tony Campolo, that preacher and sociologist, tells the story of sitting with a group of thinkers, a group of men, he said, would have been thought of as elite. These thinkers sat and talked, and as they talked, they, as they fell into that conversation and discussed, their, their thoughts and their conversation turned to religion, and it wasn't friendly. They began to talk about evangelicals and Christians and, and some of the things that they do and some of the things that are in the press, and Campolo found himself getting more upset and more turned off by what was being said, and finally said, I couldn't hold back, so I just kind of lit into the group, and I said, look, we're not all that way. We're not all that way. We don't all do dumb and stupid things. We're not. And suddenly there was an image that flashed through his mind that he had seen at a football game of somebody holding up the sign of a Bible text. And he said, we're not all like that guy that shows up at the Super Bowl and holds up a Bible text. We're thinkers. I want to read you in Campolo's words what came next. When I finished my rabid declaration... One of the men at the table took the pipe he was smoking out of his mouth, set it down, and said, Interesting you should mention that. Three years ago, I was watching the Super Bowl. It was just before halftime when the Cowboys kicked an extra point. It's been a long time ago. It was just before... <laughs> <clears throat> It was just before halftime when the Cowboys kicked an extra point. Behind the goalpost was that man you were talking about. He held up a sign that read, John 1.12. I didn't have anything else to do during halftime. So I reached up on the bookshelf of the den, pulled off my old Bible, and opened it to John 1.12, just out of curiosity. When I opened it, I found some old notes from a Bible talk that I'd heard at summer camp many, many years before when I was a teenager. I read over those notes and remembered what I had forgotten and forsaken. I got down on my knees there and then and gave my life back to Jesus. It's easy, isn't it, to become so used to it that we lose the significance of what it's saying. Maybe it's time to take the book off and the shelf and blow off the dust and re-experience that gift again. God loves the world. God expressed His love. And the third truth out of that passage the blessings of that gift come to those who believe. The blessings of that gift come to those who believe. You notice the words, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever believes, the blessings of that gift Come to those who believe. I have to, one last time, just read the Greek word's meaning. We've talked about world. We've talked about love. Now we talk about believe. Listen to this. To believe in Christ is to accept and love Him. The Greek expression, pistuo ace, to believe into, carries the sense of placing one trust into or completely on someone. In other words, it is not a mental assent, just saying, yeah, I think that's true. This is an act of placing one's faith and one's trust in Jesus. 1859, June of 1859, hundreds, actually thousands of people flocked to Niagara Falls. And when they came, they all came. Statesmen and Congress people and, and writers, newspaper editors, professors. In fact, by the time everything was over and done, even the President of the United States himself came to see what happened there. Because what happened there was a little Frenchman, five foot five, 140 pounds, 
stretched a 1,300-foot rope across the gorge beneath the falls, stretched it between the two sides, and announced, I'm going to walk the tightrope from the United States to Canada and back again. And the people showed up, believing they were coming to watch this crazy little Frenchman kill himself. When the moment came, he took the balancing pole in his hand and he stepped out onto the rope. It is said that people fainted. Others stretched and craned their necks, leaning forward to catch a glimpse of when he would go flying off the rope. Pole in hand, a step at a time, he began the journey. Got to the middle of the journey, sat down, lowered a rope to the maid of the mist that was parked below him, pulled up a bottle of wine and imbibed on the rope. And then he got up and continued his trek across the rope. Got, it, got safely to the other side. Over the next hours and days, he began to do other kinds of things. He brought one of those large old cameras that they tended to stick their heads in to take pictures, balanced it on the rope, and took pictures of the crowds on both sides. He brought a stove, prepared breakfast, ate breakfast on the rope. He walked at night, blindfolded, somersaulted across the rope. It was unbelievable what happened. It is even reported that at one point, he brought out a wheelbarrow. Said, I'm going to push the wheelbarrow across. How many of you believe I can do it? And everybody waved their hands. He pointed to a man in the front and said, get in. <laughs> and the man said, no. He said, you said you believed. He said, I do, but I'm not getting in that wheelbarrow. <laughs> That's the word. That's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Saying, Nicodemus, get in the wheelbarrow. Trust your life to me. But you know what? That's what Jesus is saying to you today. That's the invitation he's making to you. To believe. Get in the wheelbarrow. I'm going to invite you to do that. I want to speak to two groups of people this morning, just two. Not speaking to everybody here, but I am speaking to two groups of people who are like Nicodemus. The first group is religious. You went to religious schools, you work at a religious institution, you come to what I hope is a religious church. Religious people. But somehow that basic, of true and full getting into the wheelbarrow may not have happened. Maybe you signed on the dotted line, but you signed in pencil. You can smudge it, erase it. I have a dear friend named Larry Thomas. Larry Thomas was sitting in All Souls Church in London, England. Richard Bues was preaching. Richard Bues, who's preached here in our church on different occasions. And Larry said, that day, Richard spoke to me. He said, some of you have signed on the dotted line with Jesus in pencil. Today, I'm going to invite you to do it in pen. And Larry said, that's what I did. And just this week, Larry texted me this. Randy, I think that day in all souls saved and established my faith. Without it, I might be on some rubbish heap of legalism. So I want to speak to that group today. You've signed, but it's been in pencil. Today I invite you to do it in pen. I want to speak to a second group. You're like Nicodemus in the sense that you're there, it's night, you're hovering be between belief and unbelief. I want to ask you to consider stepping into the wheelbarrow putting your faith fully in Jesus. In the pew rack in front of you, that hymnal rack, there's some little cards. They look like business cards, just like this. Say, back to basics on one side. Would you take those out? Would you just make certain that anyone and everyone on your row who wants one gets one? On the back is a simple statement that says, today I place my faith in Jesus. And then there are pens in the rack, not pencils, Pins. If you sense the Spirit of God moving in your heart today 
and you want to make that step, believing, placing faith in, getting in the wheelbarrow, just sign your name and date the card. And then I want to ask you to take this card. I want you to tape it to your bathroom mirror, to your computer screen, put it in your wallet, take a picture of it and make it your screensaver on your phone to remind you that today in this place you stepped into the wheelbarrow. But I have one other favor to ask. If you're part of the group that is doing that for the first time today, there's a second card. You see the green top peeking out of the rack in front of you. It says welcome on it. We don't want you to take this step and take this journey alone. So if you've taken that for the first time today, would you just put your contact info on the front? And then on the back, check that line that says, I'm beginning a relationship with Jesus. Those of us on the pastoral staff would love to come alongside you and support you in that journey. And then you can drop this card off in the Welcome Center on your way out. And we will be in contact with you. And at the Welcome Center, they'll give you a little book to help on the journey, simply entitled Steps to Christ. It's a classic I've read and reread and will help guide your footsteps. I hope you sense and listen to the Spirit of God speaking to your heart today. Because the truths are very simple. God loves the world, and that includes you. God expressed his love in the gift of his Son. And those who want to receive the blessings of that gift do so by believing in him.
I've prayed for you this week and have prayed much. My colleagues on the pastoral staff have prayed for you. If you sense the Spirit of God moving in your heart, it'll be the best choice you ever made. Let's pray. Lord, we just sing it. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's us. Because of that, we also sing, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Lord, bring us feeble, wandering sinners back to the heart of Jesus. Thank you in his name. Amen. Everybody, thank you, family and friends who keep us reminded of birthdays and anniversaries. And we bring greetings right at the top from Pastor George Brown. Bless your heart over there in Avon Park, Florida. And George, it's been so much of a blessing to me to know you these years and now to congratulate you for your 95th birthday. Hello, Helen Weismeyer. 
Again, we're so glad for family who remind us about birthdays. And Helen up there in Seattle, happy birthday, lady. Judy Hutchinson Boyce. Again, friends let us know about birthdays. And you're over there in Toronto, Canada. Congratulations on your birthday, Judy. Hello, Fern Armbruster. Right here, a part of our Loma Linda Villa family. And I hear you're having a birthday, and I congratulate you. Nancy Rocky. Nancy, what can I say? Long, long history we have, and a blessed one. And I get to see you there with dear Ron. Congratulations on your birthday, Nancy. Hello, John Oyn. You've become such a good friend. I appreciate you so much. A part of my life and a part of Bible Lab, University Church, this community. Congratulations on your birthday, John. Beverly Price, another part of our Villa family. Glad to learn about your birthday, Beverly, and all the best to you. And Dolly Parker, you're also in the Villa family and glad to know that you're having a birthday along with your sisters and brothers there. Congratulations. Casey Hohensee. Hello, Casey. So glad to see you whenever I can and to see you there with those wonderful women in your life. Congratulations, man. Victor Brown, it's been a lot of years for us, hasn't it? Glad to know about you over at Kettering. Congratulations on your birthday and what you do there. Hello, Donna Sampson. And we have our own secrets, Donna, about where we sit in the sanctuary at Loma Linda and what you do at the organ. And now to know it's your birthday, Donna, congratulations to you as I see you there with the girls in your life. Hello, Dennis Blumberg, a part of this family here at Loma Linda as well, a part of the singers and the strummers and also involved with the Gathering Place Sabbath School. Always glad to see you. Congratulations on your birthday, Dennis. And folks, I want you to see this lady, Hazel Schultz, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 107 years old. Look at that young lady. And there she is with her children. Nydia Vemeister, so glad to be reminded of your birthday, lady. You have loving family who remind me, and I'm glad to say congratulations, Nydia, on this special day. LaDon Ask, part of our family for as long as I know, and now you're having a birthday. Congratulations. You there with Mickey. Hello, Kimber Snyder, also a part of the Loma Linda Church. Important, musically, glad to see you with your instruments. And now I'm glad to know it's your birthday and all the best to you there with Louise. Hello, Mary Olson. Yes, I'm using a picture of you and dear Ellis. Yes, we miss him, but I congratulate you on your birthday, Mary. Donna Lee Thorpe, right here, also a part of the Loma Linda University Church. Congratulations on your birthday, Donna. And Edna May. Edna May Loveless. And I love this picture of you with Brother Bill. And now that we get to use the William Loveless Fellowship Hall, I just wanted all the folks to see the two of you as you mark your birthday, Edna May. Hello, Bill Saloniuk. That smile of yours is so infectious. And I'm glad to see you Sabbath by Sabbath here at University Church on your 98th birthday, man. Nellie Kimbrough, always glad to be where you are and glad to learn it's your birthday, Nellie. Congratulations. Manzer Massey, wow. We appreciate you around Loma Linda Church here. The teaching you do, your friendship, your leadership with the Rotary Club, everything is such a blessing. Congratulations on your birthday, Manzer. Hello, Judy Peters. I was happy to learn you're having a birthday too and I'm here to congratulate you. Janet Rasuk, bless your heart. Always glad to see you here at University Church. And this is such a wonderful photo of you and your family. Congratulations. Hello, Mildred Stilson, a part of our Villa family here. And I'm glad to know you're having another birthday. You're 98th, I think. Congratulations. 
Hello, Clarence Carnahan, all the way up there in Bend, Oregon. Wish I had a picture of you, Dr. Carnahan. I don't, but I want to congratulate you on another birthday, man. Hello, Glenn Foster. Always glad to be reminded of you, particularly at birthday time. And I'm here to congratulate you and a special greeting to Pat as well. Ray Tate. Another one with whom I have lots of wonderful history. Glad to be reminded of your birthday, Ray, out there at Pacific Union office. Congratulations. Hello, Dorothy Maxwell. So glad to see you this summer over in Arizona where you and Edwin now live. Congratulations on your birthday, Dorothy. Hello, Laverne Northrup. Bless your heart having another birthday and I want to wish you all the very, very best. Flora Coppermatter. Bless your heart, your husband recently had a birthday. Now you're celebrating, and I wish you the very best for your birthday too. Kurt Delinsky. Wow, we've got lots of history back to Virginia, other places, and we get to see each other now once in a while. Happy birthday. There you are with your dear mom and your siblings. And all the best to all of us as we anticipate another week in this new year.